everybody. We're going to have just a minute or so so that everybody can join, but thank you so much for coming today. Um, I'll just kind of go through introductions really quick. Um, I'm Mana Mostatabi. I am the NIAC Communications Director. Uh, we also have Donna, our National Organizing Director, who has very graciously uh, agreed to do a lot of our tech support. God bless you. And then we have Dr. Shukumiri, who is NIAC's former board chair and a San Francisco-based clinical psychologist who specializes in the care of adolescents, adults, and families. Uh, she worked at Stanford Hospital and completed her clinical training at Duke and Stanford. So I'm sure your Persian parents are very proud. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also have the amazing Melody Moezi, who is an award-winning Iranian-American author, attorney, activist, and visiting professor of creative nonfiction at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Her latest book is The Rumi Prescription, How an Ancient Mystic Poet Changed My Modern Life. Um, it's actually behind me on the bookshelf. Um, which has come along at kind of the perfect time as we all face a lot of anxieties today. Um, so in that, I just wanted to explain maybe why we're hosting this event, um, especially among immigrant communities. Uh, mental health and wellness has been a taboo topic, and it is something very vulnerable. So it's probably very human in general to be uncomfortable discussing something so what's so heavy. And even in mainstream culture, uh, there's a culture of glossing over pain, glossing over anxiety. And you see this, you know, in various forms. But, you know, for those of you on Instagram, you can be scrolling through and there will be these like very cutesy little memes that are like, everything's OK, don't worry. And so, you know, I think sometimes we look at the culture of pain, the way that it's you know, presented in a bubblegum way, and it invalidates how we feel. And so the way that we need to move forward is by discussing this, especially among our community when we, we're a little bit uncomfortable, but there's no way for us to move forward unless we're willing to sort of lean into this discomfort. Um, and you know, the trauma and the uncertainty that we're all feeling today is just part of a shared human experience. And things aren't always okay, and that's okay. What's not okay is to gloss over our feelings and to focus on, you know, the Instagram posts or, you know, the little kitschy things that you hang on your wall that essentially say it's fine. It's fine. Um, you know, it's you're not always going to solve your anxiety by soaking in an Epsom salt bath. And I think the more <laughs> that we can really talk about, you know, our feelings being valid and ways we really can cope and being okay with not being okay, the further we can move forward. Um, I don't know, Shuku and Melody, you know, this has been a really hard year uh, for everybody. Um, and I think in particular for the Iranian American community. Um, I mean, just personally, what has been the impacts for both of you? You know, we almost went to war in January. Uh, you know, I think the year opened with Australia being on fire. We now have this like coronavirus thing that's impacting all aspects of our life. And so how are you two doing? Um, I'll start. I, I'm not doing great. Uh, I am sort of un unable to focus and concentrate in ways that I normally can. Um, I, as a writer, was like, this is, you know, this is a writing retreat. Let's use this as a writing retreat, you know, mm -hmm. that you have all this free time as an artist to use it. Um, and of course, as a professor, I'm like telling my students to do this, but I'm noticing I can't do it. And a lot of my students can't either. Uh, because you can't pretend that something is a writing <laughs> retreat when the news is so bad. <laughs> and you're not alone in this. You know what I mean? Other people are uh, in the same situation. In a writing retreat, you just run off into the woods and write. You know, uh, you don't have to worry about other things. But right now, it's, you know, you're calling family and friends and making sure they're okay. Uh, so I've had to lower my expectations for myself <laughs> with respect to productivity. Um, and have a little more mercy uh, with myself, which is, has been tough, but I'm trying. <laughs> so I totally agree and have had the same experience. I think the year has been really chaotic and difficult. 
Um, I appreciate the question because in my work, I'm always asking other people how they're doing. And very rarely does someone pause and ask me how I am. Um, and, and the answer is like, it depends on the day, right? Um, there are days where I'm doing exactly what I should be doing and it's going very well. Those are usually the days that I'm working as a psychologist. Um, and then there are days that I'm a kindergarten teacher for my daughter who's at home and I'm not so great in that role. Um, and so those days might be more challenging, right? And so I think that's, that's sort of the um, suggestion that I have for a lot of my patients and my friends is to do exactly what Melody said, to be really gentle and compassionate with yourself, to offer yourself the same kindness and willingness to be a little bit looser with expectations that you're probably offering everybody else. Yeah, I think something that I've struggled with, but I'm finally, I think after two months of quarantine and social distancing, really coming to grips with is that we, you know, our best two months ago is not going to be our best today. And that, you know, instead of especially very A type people, uh, you know, we aim for 150% at all times. And now we're operating at 75%. And I think that instead of waking up in the morning and, you know, beating ourselves up over the fact that it took us two hours to do something that usually takes us a half hour has actually helped alleviate a lot of the anxiety that I feel. I mean, I think we all just have a lot of brain fog. And there have been a couple articles that I've seen that has come out about this. Um, I'm not really sure what it is, why it's contributing to it. Maybe for me, it's just anxiety. Um, but I think it's it's pretty all across the board right now. Um, so something that uh, actually quite a few people asked, we were talking about mental health taboos, is if there's generational differences in terms of approaching mental health, um, I think there is. I mean, I can say this as someone who has struggled with her own issues and, you know, my parents are from the boomer generation. I'm a millennial and I think maybe millennials are a little bit more uh, open to exploring mental health. But I mean, what have you guys seen um, in terms of just the generational, the generational divide in mm -hmm. approaching this topic? I think it's wise to look at it generationally and not culturally. A lot of people point to our culture and sort of assume that we have some sort of special stigma about mental health and, and treatment. I think that every culture has a stigma about mental health and treatment. It just manifests in different ways. And I think seeing it generationally is actually probably more accurate. Um, I mean, I can tell you a little bit of what gives me hope. The example that I'm you know, happy to share is my daughter, as I mentioned, is in kindergarten, and she had to get on Zoom for the first time to present or share um, a couple weeks ago. And I asked her, like, how are you feeling? And she used this phrase, nerve sighted. Um, and I and I actually didn't really get it. I was like, what is nerve sight? What does that mean? And she said, well, I'm nervous, but I'm also excited. <laughs> I think it's going to be fun. Um, but I've never done it before. And I'm nervous. And that's a word that her teachers have taught her, right? And so I think when we think about stigma and we think about wellness and mental health, it's important to recognize that as we move forward, things change and they can grow and develop in really healthy ways. And children today are being given language and skills and just an awareness of things like mindfulness. How do I feel? I can feel two things at the same time, right? I can be nervous and excited. Um, and so these skills and this vocabulary, I think, gives me a lot of optimism that as time goes on, the stigma will be reduced. All right, Melanie. I had to unmute myself, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely. I think one of the hardest things for me as somebody who's living with a mental health condition, I have bipolar disorder, uh, and that within this community as an Iranian-American, um, and just in general, has been this perception, and I, and I specifically said I've lowered my expectations during this time because I need to. And as Iranians, like especially children of immigrants, like a lot of us have really, really high expectations for ourselves. And I think that's great uh, in a lot of circumstances. But when it came to getting sick, it was the first time that I was ever told to lower my expectations for myself in ways uh, by mental health providers and in ways that seemed really not right, given I had this condition for a really long time and was sick um, and still managed to graduate law school, get a master's, like finish my first book. You know, like I'd done all of this without like the proper medication was actually medication that made things worse. And now people were telling me like, now just now you have this label, so you can't do these things, uh, which was garbage, totally not true. 
Uh, and I'm grateful to my parents for allowing me to see that. But I will say what I find most disabling about my mental health condition, which falls into the category of, uh, they, they call it like serious mental illness, like versus not so serious. Like, I don't, I don't know why we distinguish them, but anyway, so it's a serious mental illness. Um, but that's not like, there are parts of it that are disabling. What's most disabling is the shame and the silence mm -hmm. and what we call stigma. And I frequently call stigma, but what we need to start recognizing is a hundred percent discrimination. Um, and stop discriminating against others within our community and against ourselves by saying we need to be quiet about this because the worst thing I think is to be silent um, because that that's that's how you create shame is through silence. Um, so being public about it, being open about it is something that's helped me a lot. Um, if only because there are people who are like, are you okay? <laughs> you know, like they know I'm dealing with yeah. a lot of things, um, which, you know, and, and it's not just that. I've helped them helped educate them in ways uh, that have helped them in their life, not just with respect to me, but with a, respect to a lot of people because one in five uh, people in a given year is dealing with a mental health condition. So that's not a tiny minority of people. I, I, you know, part of it, the silence is a big part of it, but asking for help is also very hard. And I think especially now because, you know, everyone's doing telehealth and actually we were talking about, you know, the difference between doing therapy in person and doing therapy over Zoom. And, you know, it might be difficult to connect with someone if you have never met this therapist before over video cam. But how can we ask for help? I, I remember, you know, being a teenager and as I was going through my own stuff, it was really hard to ask my parents for help. And I think even more than that, it was really hard for them to accept that I was asking for help. So I guess my question is, how, how, what can both sides do? Um, you know, how can parents or, you know, support loved ones? You know, when someone asks you for help, what's the next step? So from my perspective, it's um, really straightforward, which is there's like things to say and do and things not to say and do. And if you keep that in mind, I think it gives us all a little bit of a structure for this. You know, a lot of times when someone asks for help, if we care about them, we love them, we want to be supportive, we immediately jump to trying to fix the problem, right? So we see it as like, oh, they need X and I have Y. And so let's connect those two things and then everything will be fine. Um, I think we do that out of love and compassion and trying to help. Um, I also think we do it because maybe we're uncomfortable and the longer we have to sit with this problem, the greater and greater and bigger and bigger that discomfort grows. Um, and so I think it's an attempt to help the other person. I, I believe that it's genuine, but I also think it's an attempt to kind of moderate our own emotional reaction and, and stay feeling safe and steady ourselves. So if we're willing to kind of set that model aside and instead think about responding to a request for help by being willing within ourselves to be uncomfortable, then I think you open up a lot of space for discussion and the person receiving your help sees it as support and validation and real acceptance versus when we rush to fix the problem, what we're really saying is, I don't like what you're saying. It makes me uncomfortable. Let me quickly make it go away. Um, and that I think is, is, is the biggest um, sort of don't, right? So, so be willing to sit with your discomfort, be willing to allow the problem or the situation to be without a quick solution and know that in that space is a real opportunity for a lot of validation and love. That's lovely. Melody. I, and I, I agree with that entirely. And I also, I think it depends on the situation, you know, there's, sure. Um, when you're dealing with something that when somebody's in a mental health crisis, for instance, uh, which has oh. happened to me, like, obviously yeah. the rules are going to be different because right. you know, someone's acutely manic, like get right. them to a hospital, get right. them where they need yes. to be, get them the help they need. Yes. Um, be safe at first. <laughs> right. Be safe. Yeah. But what's, yeah. what's yeah. unfortunate is our systems are not safe. We live yeah. in a country that does not have safe systems. We live in a country where our largest, um, our primary mental health system, the largest, uh, mental health system is jails and prisons. Like <laughs> that's where we treat mental health conditions uh, in this country. So we've effectively criminalized mental illness. Uh, so it's common where you see somebody, for instance, in a mental health crisis, whether they be suicidal or manic or psychotic, whatever the specific situation, uh, that you immediately freak out and call the police. Uh, a lot of localities have mobile crisis units. Uh, that you can call, which I encourage people, if you can find a mobile crisis unit, a lot of them are 24-7. Uh, 
Um, unfortunately, sometimes you might call the mobile crisis unit and they transfer you to the police. Um, it, the police are not equipped to deal with this. And if you have to go, sometimes you end up having to call the police. And if you do, I would always encourage you to ask for a CIT officer. Um, that's somebody who has crisis intervention training. That's somebody who is prepared to de-escalate a situation. Uh, because we've had too many instances of people, specifically people of color, uh, being either arrested when they're seeking help or worse yet, murdered by the police. Um, and that's something to definitely be aware of uh, when you're trying to seek help. And it's something we shouldn't have to think about, right? Like you're already dealing with this giant crisis, but you have to recognize that our system cannot deal with it properly. And we, we don't have the supports that we need for that. Um, and we also, I think, culturally have a lot of hangups around if people find out, what if people find out, you know? Um, and especially if we're in a community of a lot of doctors, you don't want to go to this hospital because, you know, Khole Ahmed works there, you know, like, <laughs> like little things like that actually have an, have an effect. Like God forbid For they sure. find out. And I would say specifically to parents, every time you do something like that, you're putting shame into your child. Um, unnecessary shame, right? I, I had a pancreatic tumor when I was 19. Um, nobody ever made me feel ashamed about it. Right. I never right. kept that a secret. Uh, because there were things that were important. I, sh I shouldn't eat certain things. Um, and it was maybe good for people to know that. You know, like that, that was important. Likewise, I think it's really important that we make it clear that this is not something to be ashamed of. And the primary way you do that is you allow people uh, to be open about it. Uh, and in whatever way feels comfort comfortable for them, I'm not saying come out for them and be public for them, um, but also don't silence them. Uh, if they feel comfortable speaking about it, then to me personally, like that has been a huge part of my treatment, being able to speak publicly uh, and without shame, uh, which speaks more to, you know, the the society we live in than it speaks to those of us who have these conditions, yeah. for instance. Yeah. I've always I would been also very add, inspired by, I was just going to say, inspired. Melody, I've been really inspired by how vulnerable you've always been. And I think it, it, I mean, it's very motivating for other folks. I, I honestly don't think that I would have had the wherewithal to, you know, reach out to both of you and put together something like this without being so inspired by how honest and vulnerable you're willing to be publicly. Thank you. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Shuku Jan, you, you were saying. I was, yeah. was going to add on, um, I 100% agree with your shared thoughts. And I also want to just point out something that I think is really important to recognize is that that shame that you're talking about is also institutionalized in this country, right? So the way that we handle, um, the way insurance companies handle mental health reimbursement, right? Reimbursement for ear infection or for diabetes or for a pancreatic tumor is very different than for an eating disorder, um, or for depression or for a manic episode, right? And so I think it's important to recognize that is systematic and institutionalized for economic reasons, for reasons of oppression. And if you see that, then you can not always put the blame on a particular culture or a particular generation or the way a parent is dealing with it and understand that these institutional forces are really directing and, and, and entrenching the shame on a cultural level. Yeah, that makes sense. I think so there were a couple, a few people actually, quite a few people have now asked, um, what about the impact on children? Uh, how do we explain what's going on to them in a way where we're honest, uh, but not freaking them out unnecessarily? Yeah, well, I don't, I mean, I think you can prevent them from being freaked out unnecessarily, but you probably can't stop them from being freaked out because these are times that kind of have freaked out all of us, right? Um, so, so I think sometimes, you know, in that question, what I hear a little bit um, when people ask me is like, how do I ensure that my child doesn't feel discomfort or fear? Um, I don't know that you can get through a famine or a war or a global pandemic without everyone, regardless of age, feeling some degree of fear and uncertainty and to some extent freaking out, right? So the idea isn't that they're not going to have a Emotions. The idea is, can I minimize harm and can I answer questions or explain in a way that is developmentally appropriate, right? So what I tell my 10-year-old is really different than what I tell my kindergartner. Um, you know, she is really smart and understands scary things are happening, but I don't need to, nor should I be as detailed with her. Um, so the biggest piece of advice or the tip that I would give is try to meet your child at the developmental and emotional readiness range that they're at. If they're older and more mature, 
if they're more sophisticated in their thinking, if they generally handle scary things better, then you can lean into a lot of information. Um, if they're not, then then please don't, <laughs> right? Um, and then the second tip I would give, and this is one that I think um, we often aren't very mindful of, is there's no, you know, they're exposed to so much media from so many different sources. And I notice my own stress and uncertainty skyrockets anytime the news is on. And yet I think we struggle to remember that kids are seeing and hearing this and don't have the skills to process or differentiate. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think protecting them from visual images is really important and something that parents need to be a lot more attentive of. Yeah. I just wanted to add, I don't have any children. I have a lot of friends who have children and Mm -hmm. I am witnessing them being so hard on themselves. Um, in ways that hurts me watching them. It's like, like, I'm not, they think they're doing everything wrong. And it's like, there's no map for this. There's no right way to do this. Um, And my hope just for all of them, um, I have so many of them with young kids, like in the same situation. And what I see is the kids will manage. Like they, I feel like the kids will manage, but it's like, it doesn't help for you to treat yourself badly, um, which unfortunately, or, or feel guilty about, everything all the time. Like, I'm not sure that accomplishes anything. Um, so that's just my like dream and hope and prayer for all my friends, young kids, especially. Yeah. Um, the other kind of group of people that several, uh, participants wanted to know how to better support were frontline workers. Um, you know, their anxieties are definitely much different than those of us who are lucky enough to sit behind a keyboard all day. Um, so I, I, I struggle with this because I have friends who are nurses and I know they're working, you know, 48 to 60 hours a week while also having children. Um, and I, I mean, all I've been able to do is just text and say, hey, wellness check, like you're doing OK, which I think does go a long way. But what else what else can we do? <laughs> I'm happy to try. Question. Yeah, no, no, it's it is a hard, hard question. question. It's a hard question. I mean, I think as you were talking, the the thing that came up in my mind is maybe less about offering them direct support, because I think you're right. There's a limit. I can't go to their house and watch their child while they're in the ER, right? It's just there's a limit to what we can do. I mean, there's some things we can do. There are organizations that are delivering meals and, you know, other types of equipment, other types of um, sort of charitable volunteer kind of efforts. But I, I do think there's something here that that might be useful around sort of examining our own values and the decisions that we're making. Um, I might not be in the highest risk category, but I'm wearing a mask when I go out, right? So there's little choices to big choices that we make that either move sort of the society in the direction of the values that support those workers or make life harder for them. And I think those those little things um, sort of add up. And I can't help but think that they give those individuals who are on the front lines a sense of support and optimism um, about how their community is, is treating the vital work that they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I would just add, as somebody who my entire immediate nuclear family is all doctors and thankfully mm-hmm. only um, two of them right now are, are going to work and my parents, they're in California and they're retired. Um, and the state of California keeps asking them to come out of retirement, despite mm-hmm. the fact that they're in their seventies. Um, so I've been really insistent that maybe this is, you know, you've done a lot for this country. <laughs> um, right. you give in a lot. If you don't feel like you're in that place to do that, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, especially if we're seeing they don't have the protective equipment to give to you to put you in this situation. Um, but in terms of trying to support them and help them, I think one of the things I found is not always talking about this. Um, being able to just talk about other yeah, things sure. uh, can be really helpful because I think they're used to hear it. Like my sister's sick of it. You know, <laughs> she, doesn't, she doesn't want me to ask her what her protocol is every day, but I'm concerned, you know, like oh, well, she called me this morning and she's like, Oh, um, um, I have a patient coming and I'm like, is it in per- person or are you doing telemedicine? Like, how are you doing? You know, like I'm freaking out more than I need to be like, she's doing her best and she's smart, you know, and sort of to trust that, especially if it's your family member, you sort of want to just protect them as much as you can. Um, but also to realize that they need some normalcy in their lives. Um, and you could be a, a part of that normalcy, make them laugh, you know, um, give them a reason to think about something else for five minutes, you know? That's, that's I lovely. Love that. I mean, 
you know, here's the thing we, you're talking about, you know, we're caring for our families. And I think there's this additional layer that Iranian Americans have where, you know, Iran, where, you know, I have a lot of family and I'm sure some participants here also have a lot of family also undergoing, you know, the pandemic and they're not great. You know, they're not equipped well, uh, largely owed to a mix of U.S. sanctions and government mismanagement in Iran. But there's a lot of a lot of folks have also asked, you know, how do we deal with this anxiety knowing that our families in Iran are suffering? You know, what can we do? And I think that something, you know, again, Melody, you've inspired me to be very vulnerable, but something that I've only learned in the last week, actually, is that the impacts of coronavirus and the pandemic are not necessarily just people getting sick from coronavirus. Uh, my grandma passed away over the weekend and she's in Iran. Um, it wasn't coronavirus related, but, you know, what actually hit hardest was my dad being so upset that he couldn't travel to Iran for the funeral. And so we're seeing these like other sort of, you know, as we navigate this sort of weird, crazy world, the normal bad things also continue to happen. And I think for a lot of us being separated, really, you know, not just by miles, but by, I mean, what can we do to help our family in Iran and how can we cope with the anxiety we feel over it? I'm so sorry. I didn't know that, Monajan. I'm <laughs> okay. really sorry. Um, my condolences to you and your family. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have an answer for that. I just wanted to say that I'm sorry. I, I, I appreciate I, it. I, I can't believe that you're able to do this. And I'm really grateful that you're doing this for everyone else and what you're doing for our community. Um, and I will say as somebody who NIAC does not pay any money to do anything, uh, NIAC is an organization that is working to help not just Iranians here and Iranian Americans who are living in the U.S., but to help make life for our family better. Um, and as Iranians, we're not, um, we're very giving to community members and people we know and we can see, but we're not particularly politically active and we don't understand how to organize uh, in a way that could be effective sometimes. Uh, and NIAC happens to be an organization that's very good at that. Um, and this is something as a community, I think we can do more to support organizations like that uh, in whatever way we can. Even, you know, I, I've done my part and I think try and be creative about it. There is, you know, you can donate, but you can also donate your time. There are th other things you can do. Like I said, I'm not part of NIAC. I don't like, they don't pay me, but it's important for me to say that because there's so many people who, w when I uh, donated a bunch of books to y'all uh, for a fundraising campaign, people like my parents' friends who didn't understand like what uh, NIAC did, for instance, that were like, oh, well, we need an organization like that. They're very concerned about like, and we give money to like cancer hospitals in Iran and like things like that. Uh, and I'm like, great, but you know, there is not a way for you to give money if there are sanctions. Like there are things that will prevent every good thing you want to do in Iran. Our political system could prevent that from happening um, and is preventing that from happening. And the way that you stop that is through engaging with that political system in ways uh, that NIAC has done um, for us. And so we need to find a way to, to support uh, NIAC and other organizations like that. So my plug. Um, you know, a few people have also asked, uh, how can we better support the Iranian people during this time? And the answer is advocate for the sanctions that are impeding humanitarian aid to Iran to be lifted. Call your reps, check out the NIAC website. We've got tons of actions that you can take. But really, the most cut and dry thing is that if the Iranians cannot access the ventilators and masks and basic medications they need, this is going to go on for a long, long time. And I think coronavirus has shown that, you know, as much as the world has sort of moved in this like isolationist direction, we are a global community. And honestly, every single day, you guys drive me. I hope you, I, I want this community to know that everybody at NIAC, Everyone who supports NIAC, we wake up every single day with a singular goal of supporting this community. And so, you know, we, we're talking a lot about how we're coping. And I just want you all to know that NIAC and my community has given me a venue to cope. Um, with that said, a lot of other folks want to know what resources are out there and what can we do, not just, you know, maybe we don't want to look at outside support 
but also what can we do to sort of move towards hope and healing? Mm -hmm. So I'll try, I'll, I'll try to address that. Hope and healing is, um, it's such a beautiful and important theme because I think we're, we are in this situation where every day there's news and a reason to be more depressed and to lose hope. Um, and it's important to recognize that we're still a community and we still have avenues for values-based action, whether it's through NIAC or something you're doing locally or in your own home. Um, and that's where sort of hope resides, right? So I think there's this sort of first step we have to take, which is really around acknowledgement of how we're feeling and specifically acknowledgement um, that we carry this very sort of special vulnerability, right? So I can talk about it a bit personally, which is, you know, I'm an Iranian American, I'm an immigrant, right? I see myself as someone who carries identity and cultural heritage from a place that's constantly under threat, um, either by war or of, you know, economic sanctions that are very harsh. Um, and so, and also as a person who is a part of a greater community that is, um, you know, facing a lot of bigotry and a lot of hatred, right? Starting from the president trickling all the way down. Um, so if I can start there, um, then what I can do is really explore what that vulnerability means um, in terms of value-based action. So for me, that means volunteering for NIAC, right? Or, or being willing to sit here and, and try my best to be of service to the people that I love. Um, each of us has an answer to that, but I think to, to figure out your path to mean, meaningful values-based action, you have to to start with a real acceptance of what makes you vulnerable and what your values are. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's a lot. That's a lot. So what else are there resources that folks who maybe if, you know, you don't even have to be in a crisis to look for resources. Sure. Um, are there, what, what can folks do? What's out there? So, you know, we do have a national suicide prevention hotline. Um, and I think Donna, who's helping out with the technical side of things, is going to share all the phone numbers so you don't have to go with my memory. Um, that's available 24-7 to anyone who needs to talk, wants, you know, to just connect with someone and have an anonymous, safe way to process whether they're in a crisis um, or just struggling in some way. Um, our community also has an organization called the Raha Foundation, which um, connects people to mental health providers, um, whether based on language or cultural heritage and understanding. Um, and the National Alliance on Mental Health also has a hotline. I think their hours are more limited. It's sort of business hours. Um, but they're really great at connecting people to resources for family members, um, specifically, who are going through either a crisis or a struggle. So there are resources out there um, in the community. And I think the biggest barrier outside of the institutional barriers I mentioned before is really stigma and, and acceptance within yourself that you might need more support. Mm -hmm. I will also say for some of the younger folks, uh, there's a crisis chat line. Uh, I, some of my students are like mm -hmm. anxious to talk on the phone. Like yes. <laughs> they yes. genuinely are anxious yes. about, I'm not at all, but, um, uh, so, so that's why I meant said younger folks or anybody who's anxious to talk on the phone. You can, there is a crisis chat line. Um, there are lines specifically for veterans. Like there's a lot of resources mm -hmm. and I'm sure yeah. Uh, we'll be helping those, helping share some of those as well. I've had a lot of great experiences with the Depression and Bipolar mm -hmm. Support Alliance. Um, they have support group meetings, uh, and a lot of those meetings have been taken online, um, and they're doing doing those still online. And those support groups, personally, were really helpful uh, for me for years. I went after I was first diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Um, and the same with people who are dealing with substance abuse issues, the AA meetings that are going online, a lot of those kinds of meetings uh, that have helped so many people. Now they're like, oh, they don't exist, but they still exist. People have found ways to take them online um, that have been helpful. So there are a lot of resources out there. And it's important to know that if you are calling, I think, and Shuku made a really good point of this, like you don't, when you call the suicide prevention lifeline, you don't need to be like on a ledge, literally, like waiting to jump. Please before call you before call. you're on like, the ledge. Please call before <laughs> that happens. <laughs> Way before. Um, yeah, no, and you'll notice like there are literally, like you can see bridges now that have some pamphlets on, on the sides of the bridges. It's So don't wait till that point. Um, and they, they're used to talking to people who are in crisis, which means they're not at actively suicidal at this moment but they're doing really badly. You can still talk to them. You can still ask them for resources in your own community. Uh, and it's worth reaching out and doing that. And I, the last thing I wanted to mention was the Trevor Project has a lifeline and there's a trans lifeline as well for LGBTQ youth. Um, so hopefully we'll have that list as part of the resources as well. 
Yeah, we'll make sure uh, to post all of these numbers and links that our amazing panelists are talking about on the website. And we'll, we'll make sure to send that link out to everyone as well. Um, but Melody, I wanted to circle back a little bit and talk about your book, because I said this meant I, the roomy prescription, it came out at such an opportune time. I know it, it was kind of hit as, you know, it's, you've had to cancel book tours and, you know, you and I had a couple events set up that maybe weren't going to happen. Um, but reading through your book, and I've, I think I've said this like 15 times now, it's, it's a self. Um, it is really just everything resonates. And I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write the Rumi prescription and, you know, where, how it fits into our day to day. Yeah, you know, I think something that has become really popular to talk about is this notion of intergenerational trauma. Um, and I think uh, those of us especially, you know, I was born in 1979. Um, my, I was a fetus when my mom left Iran. <laughs> so um, this idea that you inherit certain kinds of traumas, uh, whether it be war or revolution or other things, like we are very familiar with this intergenerational trauma. Uh, but we don't talk quite as much about intergenerational resilience about uh, post-traumatic growth versus post-traumatic stress. Um, and what I found was one of the greatest ways to pursue that is to go back to your own heritage, go back to the, to the things that your own people, your own ancestors found hope and healing in. Uh, and certainly for my family and for so many Iranians, that is Sufi poetry, right? Um, the, it's hard to explain to people who aren't familiar with it, like what, how vital and important that is. Um, I remember my editor when we were selling this book, and one of the editors who was interested was like, "So this is so rare, you know? You have an Iranian dad who recites poetry. Like how?" I was like, "No, it's not oh rare at all. <laughs> That's <laughs> a requirement to be an Iranian right. dad." I know. Yeah, I was like, "No, no, no. This is really common. I'm amazed no one else has." I was like excited no one else had written a book about it yet. Like <laughs> it's surprising it hasn't been written. But learning this poetry from my father and being like, "This is an inheritance." I can only collect in life uh, was something really important to me. And as somebody who had almost died at a very young age, uh, I realized how fragile life is and that I can't count on my parents being here all the time. Um, and so I thought if I go back and maybe try and use that poetry that growing up, my dad always comforted me with or attempted to comfort me with and I took for granted, uh, maybe there was something for real there that I could, that I wasn't paying attention as a kid that I was not only taking for granted, just like rolling my eyes and being like, I've heard this 20 times, I'm done, you know? Um, but being able to go back to it uh, really helped me a lot creatively uh, to figure out where I belong and what what shoulders we stand on, you know? Like, this this is where we come from. Like, how amazing is that? That this is where we come from and we're so much of our culture is wiped from it when someone like Rumi is presented, I mean, Rumi, Molana is presented to the so-called West. It's presented in a way that wipes so much of the culture from it. Um, and to be able to reclaim that uh, was so powerful for me. And my hope is for the readers reading it, uh, especially the Iranian readers, just to be able to say, this is what I come from. This is who I am. Uh, and take pride in that and find some hope in that as well. Um, that was beautiful. Um, somebody actually asked, what was the hardest part of writing the Rumi prescription? Mm -hmm. uh, the living it. I'm very impatient. Um, I, I thought I could go to California. My parents live in San Diego. I was like, I'll go for a month. I'll write the whole book. I'll, I'll yeah. learn for my, my Farsi is really not great. I, I'm like kitchen Farsi. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, and I thought I could go and, and write it really quickly. Uh, and it took pretty much five years from the point of realizing I wanted to write it to, to actually getting it published. Um, but also, I think what was hard for me is my dad kept saying, this is not for a book. Like, it's nice that you're writing a book. He's mm -hmm. very proud of me that I write books. But right now, like, he's still calling me every day with poems. You know, this isn't something that stops when the book is published. Um, it's something that he's like, this is something you have for the rest of your life. This is an inheritance you carry with you and inside of you. Um, and it's not, and it's great that we have a book now. And I, I hope this will help bridge sort of the generational gap, especially for Iranian Americans like me who were grown up here, 
but whose parents came from Iran. And we feel like there's that giant chasm between us in terms of communication. And one of the most beautiful things my dad said to me during this process was, I, I asked him once, like, you know, there's so much that's lost in translation. Don't, aren't you sad sometimes that we don't fully speak the same language? And he said, what are you talking about? Uh, what about everything you win in translation? Uh, which I was like, <laughs> I'd never, that was a concept that I never even thought about. And his argument was, every new language you learn is a new universe that you win. And we gave you an extra universe. Like that, I'm glad to have been able to give you an extra universe. And now you still have this other universe you can connect with. Um, so yeah, I, I had not thought of it that way. I always thought of the things that are lost as opposed to the things that are gained. And there's so much that's gained. Um, so yeah, the heart, the hardest part of, of writing it was sort of living, living it to write it. I thought I, I, I thought it would be a very different book than it was. Um, it turned out to work out better, but I, I thought I could do one of those. I wrote it in a month. Um, <laughs> well, I think it's all about managing expectations, whether we're in a crisis or not. So yeah. there's also that. Um, somebody asked a question and I'm going to give it a little bit of context first. You know, people are a little bit different during sort of crisis mode. And I think it brings out the best and the worst, and maybe it amplifies some of our own kind of quirks. I know I'm a very anxious person in general, but can manage it on the day to day. Whereas now I'm, you know, I wake up every morning and I kind of have this like, you know, realization, you like remember everything that's going on. It kind of hits you. Um, and so we're not, you know, I think we have to be a little bit compassionate towards each other and give each other a little bit of leeway and be really gentle. But one Persian mom who is being overly hard on herself just sent a question that basically said, I can't help keep, I can't help but remind and advise my husband and my kids over and over again when they're making mistakes. Uh, you know, it seems like, you know, what is your best advice in this situation? Uh, you know, people who are maybe a little bit more impatient right now or irritable. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she wants to know how we, how do I drive my family crazy less? And <laughs> I think that, I think the answer here is stop being so hard on yourself, but I will turn it over to yeah. the other two. Yeah. Well, we all drive our families crazy in some way. I mean, right. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's sort of, I think the bigger thing to accept is like to let go of this idea of being perfect mother, perfect child, perfect spouse, perfect psychologist, perfect, whatever. Right. Um, and, and to instead, I think, see yourself as a human being and human beings make mistakes and sometimes annoy other people and sometimes say things that are mean or impatient or irritable. Um, so I think there's a piece of this that starts with accepting yourself as a human being. Um, and learning that whatever flaws you might have um, will probably be accepted and are far less powerful than you think in terms of how they affect other people. Um, if in fact, this is more like I'm noticing I'm feeling worse and I don't know how to stop that from manifesting, then I would say that's a different answer, um, which is maybe, you know, think about ways to get support for yourself, right? The time is that I find that I am more circling around the same lecture or the same reminders to my kids, the same sort of irritability zones is usually when I need to take a break myself, right? And so it's, it's a call to remember that self-care might be the basis of some change. So we have just about 10 minutes left. Um, if anyone has questions, feel, please feel free to type them in now. Um, but, and as you're typing, I wanted to turn to Shuku and Melody and just ask on a personal level, what are you guys doing day to day to cope? What does self care look like for you guys now? You're going to find my answer kind of annoying. Um, <laughs> Fair warning, um, because here's the here's the thing. I, I have to preach this all the time, so like I have to practice it, right? I don't really like I have some space to not be perfect, but um, but it's it's a little bit easier for me because I'm coming from this very privileged place of spending all day every day talking to people about self acceptance and self love and self care, um, and so that means that I'm reminded of that as a theme more often, um, and so. Um, I think it's slightly easier for me to integrate it in my own life. I mean, I don't mind sharing that I'm a runner and being outdoors is something that's really, really important for me. Um, partly because I'm outdoors and I love running, partly because no one's talking to me on the times that I'm outdoors and running. <laughs> so I think it's about sort of figuring out like what overwhelms me and what am I doing too much of and trying to like,
like find something in self care that is like the opposite of that and provides you a little bit of, of space. Uh, I have also just been trying to be gentle with myself and realize that if I'm having a bad day, I'm having, and especially this matters if you have, if you have a history of dealing with depression, I'm allowed to be depressed for a day and that not be clinical depression, right? Everyone is allowed that we're, we're allowed and, and just sort of allowing myself to feel whatever it is I'm feeling, um, and to grieve for the things that I need to grieve for. Like the book tour that was canceled. A lot of my instinct is to say, well, people are dying. Who am I to be upset about this? You know, the, these little things. And I, you, you know, I think about my students who don't have a commencement, you know, like that kind of thing. Who am I to be, um, I, I don't have the right almost to, to be upset about this, but you do like, <laughs> and just recognizing that I am entitled to grieve the things that I need to grieve. Um, for me, going outside has been really important. I recently, a couple of days ago, I went to the inside, inside, I went swimming in the ocean for the first time uh, mm -hmm. since the, all of this happened. Uh, and it just felt so amazing to just be back in nature um, to the point that like the, they've closed the parking and we don't live on the beach. So we can't go and park there. And we, we just were visiting a friend. So we were able to park. Um, but I won't be able to go back for a while. I don't know when they're going to the parking. So I haven't washed my hair. I still have ocean in my hair. And I was like, you know what? I like the idea of having ocean. Like I can still smell some ocean in my hair. I don't know that like, maybe that's like part of hygiene. That's an issue, but I, I love, I love still having some sand spill when I move my hair a little. Little things, little things. Can be happy. We're going to chalk that up to you being an artist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> speaking of, so somebody actually had one more question. Uh, they wanted to know, and we can, uh, we can share this link later, but do you know any side-by-side -side Persian English roomy books or links that exist? Do those exist? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, they, my specific books I have uh, are in Boston, or I would like show them to you. There's one called Rending the Veil uh, that's really great. Uh, my dad and I are actually working about getting the Persian of this book out. All, all the poems in this, we're, we're going to release the Persian for people uh, publicly for free. Um, there's, there's a book of quatrains that's green. <laughs> You know, in the in the um, in the back of the of my book, there's some listed, but there's a book, a giant book of quatrains that's green, and I don't know, and it's paperback and green, and I am blanking on the name of the author, but it has a lot of quatrains, both in English and in um, Farsi, uh, and there there's a few, not as many as you would hope, um, but there are, there are a few others, and I would suggest if there is a book that you really love and you want you want the translation, especially if the author is. Uh, speaks the language. Uh, it's worthwhile to ask the author. It was gen like just a, a dozen people wrote me being like, "Can we have the Farsi?" And I was like, "Okay, this is embarrassing. I need to give them the Farsi." So we might actually do it for you if you ask us. Okay, great, Melly. I'm going to ask you to send me those because I think people <laughs> want all the titles. Um, so there's one more question, and I think this is actually a very important question. <sighs> so. Some folks have said that, you know, maybe they've lost dear loved ones and families. And in our culture, gathering when someone passes is a big part of the healing and the hope. And so what do we do in the absence of being able to take comfort in the cultural traditions that we're used to? I, I mean, I, I don't have an answer. Yeah. I, I, I think so hard. This, this comes back to the grieving the things that like that really sucks. That really sucks. And for us to pretend that whatever we find to replace it could be better or the same, even close to the same is deluding ourselves. We, we have to accept that this is a really bad situation we're in and however we're feeling, it's okay to feel that. Um, and I, 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 I also, I, I don't have an answer for that because to me, that's unthinkable. Just the idea of dying alone without your family and as a family member, not being able to be there is unthinkable. And, and to sort of not, I mean, sh I'm sure I'm hoping, Shuku, you have other like solutions for this, but whatever, no solution, 
<laughs> I mean, whatever solution you find, like whatever solution someone gives you, it's not going to be the same as having everyone in the same house, you know, and you can't hug people like that. There's something about human touch, you know, um, and, and not having that is something worth grieving as well and worth taking into account that however you're grieving, it's possible that it's even worse because of this. Um, and at least acknowledge that. I can try. Um, this is a really hard question. So for, for a couple of reasons. First, I think the topic is very hard and painful. Um, I want to start by just, um, I don't mind sharing that even as you read that question, I did that very thing that I started off today of saying that you shouldn't do, which is I started coming up with all these great solutions to how you could still grieve, even though the grief is different, right? Um, because the question makes me so uncomfortable and I'm mindful that I, I felt my eyes tear up. I felt my hands get clammy, like in my body on a chemical level is a reaction in response to that question, right? So as a human, what do I wanna do? I wanna come up with a list of ways in which that barrier can be overcome and you can still participate in a healthy, culturally sensitive grieving process. Okay, so instead of that, <laughs> what I think I'll say instead is um, that there's grief and then there's complicated grief, right? So as a clinician, I've been trained to kind of assess that, right? Is the grief that someone is going through something that pretty much maps out to what we can developmentally and culturally expect for this person? Or is it something that has a series of events connected to it um, where it's so complicated that I actually can't expect this to map out to a typical grief? So examples are when a loved one dies of suicide or a loved one dies of homicide um, or in combat. Um, during um, in the military, right? So when something happens that is sort of um, above and beyond the normal, as far as normal can go, um, expected sort of grieving process. I think what people are going through right now, um, I think it's not unfair. I think it's reasonable to say is a complicated, different level of grief because you've lost the person um, and you've lost them in a, you know, possibly horrible way that is very separate from you and from the family and any reasonable expectation of visitation at the hospital, um, flowers in the room, um, real security that the person is being uh, medicated such that they're not experiencing too much pain. Um, right? They're in ICU. A lot of patients in ICU experience severe levels of, of hallucination and, and, and real um, difficulty recognizing what's real. It's a very scary place. I can't guarantee that someone in that situation is getting the same level of care, right? So all the normal expectations are kind of out the window. And I think to accept that in a real radical way um, is so upsetting that even talking about it is still sort of triggering all those like reactions in me, but is a powerful way to start the process of grief in whatever way is going to be right for you and your family, right? So start with the radical acceptance that it's different. Start with the radical acceptance that it's not fair or the same or even culturally appropriate. And yet here we are with it. Thank you. It was really Thank thoughtful. You so Somebody much actually just knowing that there's a, t a word for like complicated grief, yeah. like that there's a different category, honestly makes me feel better just to think that the knowledge of that. And I didn't know that. So thank you for that. Uh, somebody had a really sweet idea uh, about writing private letters to those who have passed. Um, you know, I think there are people are going to come up with creative solutions that work for them. And yeah, I mean, thank you for sharing. I think that's a beautiful idea. Um, well, we've hit the top of the hour. Um, I don't know, Melanie or Shuku, if you have any closing you know, final thoughts that you wanted to share. Just that it's an honor to be in community with you all. I mean, thank you for providing this um, just wonderful space for our community and for us and for all that you do. I second that. Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you so much, Shuku and Melody, for joining us. And thanks for to everybody who also joined this. Um, you know, starting this conversation and having you guys asking questions, I think is going, you know, it's the big first step to really destigmatizing mental health and wellness. Um, we will be posting a recording of this along with a little write-up and all the resources that we've mentioned. So feel free to, you know, pass that along to your friends and family. And I'm sure we will be having more of these chats in the future. So thank you again. And everybody stay safe, stay home, wash your hands. All right, take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye.